Good morning to all. Today's topic is on periodontal splinting and tooth mobility. Learning outcomes are discuss the factors considered in the etiology for tooth mobility and explain what index used for tooth mobility. Explain the clinical methods to determine tooth mobility. <coughs> explain the objectives of splinting. List the indications and contraindications of splinting. What is tooth mobility? It can be defined as a degree of looseness of a teeth. In simple words, if you want to explain, it is refers to the movement of loosening of teeth within the sockets, either it should be vertically or horizontally. So it is primarily caused by gingival diseases and trauma. So dental mobility shows a total loss of tooth attachment. If you want to explain or to measure the tooth mobility, it is the sum of gingival recession as well as the probing depth. There is a total attachment loss is called as clinical attachment loss. This probing can be done by periodontal probe. So this whole attachment loss is, is directly proportional to the dental mobility or tooth mobility. So tooth mobility can be of two types that is physiologic and pathologic. What is physiology type of tooth mobility? There is a slight degree of movement will be there for all teeth. Even perfectly healthy ones also have some degree of uh, mobility when some moderate force is applied. So it might show tipping movement until a closer contact has been established between root and marginal bony tissues. So it will be greatest during the morning and minimal during sleep. So, and the other type is that pathologic. Pathologic that is due to the pathologic cause. That is tooth movement caused by progression of periodontal disease or due to any trauma. So, it refers to any degree of perceptible movement in facio-lingual, mesiodistal or axial when the force is applied to tooth. And moreover, there are different stages of tooth mobility. There is the initial stage and secondary stage. So, what is that initial stage? There is the intra-socket stage. That is tooth moves within the confines of periodontal uh, ligament. And the other one that is a secondary stage that is occurs gradually and entails deformation of alveolar bone in response to increased horizontal forces. So there is a two that is they are the two different stages of tooth mobility. Coming to the causes of tooth mobility, it can be due to loss of attachment, due to pathological conditions, or due to increased forces on tooth. So first one, loss of attachment. Under that, we have category periodontitis. Uh, that is low, that is these are the factors that lead to loss of attachment that is periodontitis, dental abscesses, resorption of roots and receding alveolar bone. So this will lead to grease loss of attachment and then finally tooth mobility. Then it can be due to pathology conditions, for example, pregnancy hormones. And the pregnancy hormones in that case, that is increased progesterone estrogen level. So there will be increased uh, response to local factors. So it can lead to increased tooth mobility. And also it can be due to osteoporosis that is in decrease in the density of bonds. So this pathological condition also will lead to tooth mobility. The last one that is the increased forces. So it can be due to bruxism, one habit that is a clenching of teeth or due to dental trauma that is uh, biting, uh, that is hitting on tooth forcefully with some instrument or like some trauma or malocclusion that is a bite interruption abnormal biting it can lead to uh, that is lead to increased forces on tooth and it will lead to tooth mobility or due to failure of orthodontic treatment so some amount of failure of orthodontic treatment means that the increased forces or uh, that is improper orthodontic movement can lead to that lead to increased force on tooth and this lead to tooth mobility so coming to evaluation of tooth mobility, how we can evaluate tooth mobility during then the routine examination. So that this movement can be usually measured by applying, applying direct pressure to this individual teeth with a finger or a dental instrument. It can be either with the two dental instruments or with the finger and with the dental instrument. Okay. So in order to accurately eva evaluate tooth mobility, two non-working ends of the dental instruments can be used. There is uh, this mirror handle and the probe handle. So this will be pressed on the buccal and lingual surfaces on the tooth. So as it's it's very clearly seen in the picture. That is, this is this is the diagram. That is, the both ends uh, are pressed from both buccal and lingual surfaces. Another method is that to use a finger on the fringe surface of the tooth and uh, and feeling for a moment while the patient grinds uh, their teeth or chews. That is, you can just place with the finger and the patient has to bite on it and grinds or the teeth. Or you can use either one side finger and the other side with the instrument. Okay.
and with the uh, that is with the horizontal movement for the vertical movement you can use uh, one side handle of one instrument okay so this is how it is evaluated so coming to the classification of tooth mobility so here we have taken there is a most pronounced uh, classification by miller in 1938 so he described the most common clinical method in which tooth is held between two handles of two instruments and moved in buccolingual direction with finger and instrument so this uh, this is the technique that he used to define the mobility and it scored into zero score zero one two three so what is zero there is no detectable mobility one that is distinguishable tooth mobility and score two that is a crown of tooth moves more than one mm in any direction and a movement of more than one mm in any of the direction that is both horizontally or vertically okay so coming to the treatment of uh, tooth mobility so the treatment of uh, tooth mobility always occurs with the proper correction of occlusal forces there is this excessive occlusal forces from para function or deflective tooth contacts are the frequent causes of uh, this excessive uh, mobility so whenever the occlusion is the cause occlusal therapy is always performed first so this is then the mobility is then evaluated over time to determine if it results before splinting is considered. So that is the first line of treatment. There is proper correction of occlusal forces of the two to normalize the relationship between antagonizing teeth in occlusion. So this will eliminate excessive forces. Okay. So there is occlusal correction that is termed called coron coronoplasty. And the next one is that any inflammation of the periodontal supporting apparatus must be controlled before making a decision on splinting. So first line of treatment is scaling and root planning and this inflammation should get resolved and if this patient will be recalled after two weeks. And as a first line of therapy along with the scaling and root planning you have to remove the occlusal force also. So this excessive tooth mobility can be eliminated by splinting process by joining mobile teeth by other teeth in the jaw into fixer unit so after doing all these procedures still if there is mobility this can be stabilized by using splinting okay otherwise it, if it is cannot be uh, splinted properly then it can go for extraction and replacement of missing teeth so coming to the next uh, category that is a splinting so what is splinting what is a periodontal splint so this is an appliance used for maintaining or stabilizing or immobilizing mobile teeth in their functional and physiologic functions positions so what is periodontal splint it is an appliance used for maintaining or stabilizing or immobilizing mobile teeth in their functional and physiological positions so that is the splinting uh, stabilizes the teeth as a unit which includes healthy teeth and which redirects the forces from individual tooth to the unit as a whole dentition so that is what the splinting usually does and uh, for the fractured tooth or bond which requires at least splinting for six to eight weeks so with no fracture of teeth on bone may require splinting for two to three weeks okay so whereas in case of avulsion of tooth this may re uh, require semi-rigid splint of seven to ten days so these are the requirements for splinting so as we told when the teeth are splinted all the teeth in the splint share the occlusal load to some extent and the rigidity of the splint and the number of teeth used determine will determine how the forces are distributed so including the healthier teeth results in a new increase in the crown root ratio so basically by including all the healthier teeth it will increase the crown root ratio and a net decrease in the force to the individual tooth especially in a coronal direction since horizontal forces are believed to be more traumatic than axial forces coming to the objectives of periodontal splinting so what are the objectives there is to provide a rest reduce mobility redirect the forces redistribute the forces and restoration of functional stability to promote healing uh, under uh, of underlying periodontal tissues by removing occlusal trauma to promote patient comfort and function Redirection of occlusal forces of all teeth in, included in the splint. So this ensures that forces are within the adaptive capacity of the periodontia. And to preserve the arch integrity, splinting restores proximal condyles, which reduces food impaction at the proximal area. So that is, there should be an adequate space between the connector and the papilla for access uh, with the dental flows or interdental brush. Okay. 
and to promote psychological well-being and to aid in effective surgical procedure. Coming to indications of uh, splinting, so this is very important that to facilitate normal masticatory function, to facilitate scaling and surgical procedures, for example, if it is uh, too mobile for, so after scaling, uh, if it is very much mobile, we have to splint for before going for regenerative procedures for placing bone grafts and membrane, you have to stabilize the teeth before we go for surgical procedure. And to stabilize teeth after orthodontic uh, movement. So after uh, orthodontic movement, some amount of tooth mobility will be there. So retainer, as a retainer, periodontal splinting has to be done. So stabilize the teeth after acute dental trauma. Sometimes acute dental trauma will lead to tooth mobility. So you have to stabilize it in order to prevent tipping and drifting of teeth. So the movement of teeth and to prevent extrusion of unopposed teeth. So for extrusion, for supra eruption, if it is for preventing the extrusion of uh, an opposed tooth. See, for example, if there is uh, opposing tooth is missing, then the other opposing tooth will get extrusion, extruded. So, that is, that is the prevent extrusion of an opposed tooth. Coming to contraindications. So, what are the contraindications? It is important. There is moderate to severe tooth mobility in the presence of periodontal inflammation, primary occlusal trauma, definitely it is contraindicated. And if there is insufficient number of firm teeth to stabilize, for example, if there is generalized mobility, you cannot get stabilization from, you cannot get support from the a neighboring tooth or adjacent teeth, then it is contraindicated. And also prior or, or occlusal adjustment has not been done on teeth. So definitely occlusal adjustment has to be done before going for a splendid. And also patients with poor oral hygiene. Coming to what are the advantages and disadvantages. So advantages you know that is alveolus remodeling of alveolar bone and periodontal ligament for orthodontically moved tooth and which provides healing of supporting structures and fine stability and comfort for patient and which facilitates surgical procedures by keeping the tooth immobile distributes occlusal forces on a wide area. So these are the advantages. So alveolus remodeling, healing will be done, stability will be done and comfort for the patient and which facilitates surgical procedures and distributes occlusal forces. Okay. Then what are the disadvantages? Disadvantages will be compromised oral hygiene maintenance. If one tooth of the splint is in traumatic occlusion, it can injure the periodontium of all teeth within the splint. The development of caries is an unavoidable risk. Coming to criteria of an ideal splint, it should be simple, it should be economic, it should be stable and efficient, it should be hygienic, non-irritating, should not interfere with any of the treatment, should be aesthetically acceptable, should not provoke iatrogenic disease. So classification of splints, uh, just a brief note on this. So according to the period of stabilization, it has been classified into temporary, provisional and permanent. So what do you mean by temporary splint? So it will be given on a short basis to stabilize during periodontal therapy or after a traumatic. That is, for example, for avulsion of teeth, uh, for re-splint, uh, re-attach the tooth of avulsed tooth. So it has to be done for 7 to 10 days. And provisional splint is there. So it will be done for several months. So this allows the clinician time to observe the healing response uh, to treatment and to make, for example, if you are splinting the teeth and giving the regenerative procedure, it has to get, uh, we have to observe for several months for seeing the healing response to treatment and to make changes based on patient response. So this enables a clinician to properly design a more permanent and biologically acceptable form of stabilization. Then coming to the permanent splint that is used indefinitely. For example, uh, this cannot be removed in case of with reduced periodontia. For example, after periodontal flap surgery, so patient will have a recession and with reduced periodontia, the, if the uh, teeth are mobile, but inflammation is not there, no pocket depth. But for the stabilization, we need to have permanent splint. So that is the permanent splinting can be done. So, these splints uh, are of uh, different categories. So, that is divided into, of these categories can be divided into extracoronal and intracoronal splints. So, what do you mean by intracoronal? That is, you can see that intracoronal, that is, with, it will be done inside the tooth surface. So, it is, it will be, there will be a small cut inside the tooth surface. 
Today this this was done before, but nowadays it's not been used that much. So they are most commonly used type of splint, as the name implies. The technique entails making a cavity preparation into the lingual side. Okay, so it won't be uh, that much uh, aesthetically compromised one, but it can lead to some amount of uh, tooth. Obviously, it is removing tooth surface, so it can lead to sensitivity and uh, for further future uh, like caries and all. So, and maintenance also, it's very difficult. So, this preparation is used to increase strength and retention of restorative material. So, these are the materials used, whereas composite resin with wire or in lace, nylon wire and all. So this is the procedure you can see that so that this will be removed the coronal area it will be removed according to the length uh, width of the wire and this will be placed inside and then given the composite. So it can be uh, either wire or inlays or anything it can be. Then coming to extra coronal splints uh, compared to the intra coronal splints this will have more advantages in case of uh, oral hygiene maintenance but aesthetically it will be compromised if you are giving it in a buccal side or it will be not that much comfortable like intracoronal splints but for the maintenance purpose and for compared to the uh, disadvantages this is uh, disadvantages of intracoronal splints this is more advantageous than so they can be considered provisional or prevalences in contrast to uh, intracoronal this type of splint does not involve any tooth preparation so they can be of different types extra coronal it can be like tooth bonded plastic can be night guard welded bands ligature splints continuous clasp so these are the different types of splinting we are using so in case of video we are using this fiber splint so that is the common splints that are used in ortho uh, as well as the other departments but here in perio we use uh, that is most recent one that is a fiber splint so this fiber splint will be provided like this with definite amount of uh, width so this can be longer th than the uh, than the expected one so we can make the measurement of first and then you can cut it down and make it get adapted and with the uh, with the composite, so one layer of composite can be applied over the tooth surface and then you can place this fiber over it and then you can adapt it freely and then you can cure it. So this is how fiber splinting we are doing it in the it in our department. So summary of uh, this is that splinting is effective therapeutically and achieves its objectives. Almost all the, all splints demand extra measure of motivation and diligence from the patient in plaque control. Therefore, splinting should be undertaken only in patients who have proved their willingness and ability to perform these measures. Okay, thank you.